Okay. So, we just talked about simulation theory and some thought experiments having to do with simulations. That was related to kind of what we've been studying during this metaphysics and epistemology unit. You know, what is the nature of our universe? Is it real? Is it a simulation? Now we're kind of going to go off on a tangent. And we're going to talk about the existence of God. Because that's an interesting thing to at least discuss in philosophy classes. It's a question you've all probably asked yourselves. It's a question that probably determines how you live your life, right? I was going to say that when you mentioned that the if it's a simulation, the computer wouldn't have to like recreate everything. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of like something doesn't exist until you think about it. Yeah. And then yep. God is always thinking about like everything. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's interesting how Barclay and that piece kind of tie in, right? Yeah. The pieces that we're going to be looking at now, we got one piece by St. Thomas Aquinas, and we got one piece by Blaise Pascal, both talking about God just in different ways. So one of the readings I asked y'all to do for today was an excerpt from this guy's magnum opus, the Summa Theologica, which I bought my dad a copy of this book. I think it comes in like two or three volumes. It's over a thousand pages. This dude wrote a lot about God. Extremely influential. And a lot of his theology is still what a lot of Christian sects rely on today. Aquinas was an extremely influential Italian theologian, philosopher, and priest, actually. He's known for his theological writings, his writings on ethics. Uh, I believe he had a hypothesis on what makes a war just or unjust. He wrote about war and other political things as well. We're not going to look at him in, in uh, other units. He did write a lot of other stuff, not just God's stuff. Before we start actually getting into his proofs for the existence of God, I kind of want to give you an overview and background of theology in general, to give you a better sense of what he's thinking, and the kind of field in which he's working. The question of God has been around for, well, probably since humans first existed, or at least were capable of thinking and reflecting in that way. There are different ways of doing theology, which is the study of God, different methods. In the West, in Europe, and in North America, most theologians rely on positive theology, or they work within positive theology. Positive theology is one way of trying to investigate the nature of God and God's existence that relies on describing God 
through positive claims. That is, if you're doing positive theology and you're talking about God, you're saying God is this, God is that, God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing. You're attributing things to God. God is all omnibenevolent, all good. God is all perfect. This is an example of positive theology, describing God by attributing stuff to him. In the positive theological tradition, a lot of different ideas of God have sprung up. Probably the most famous one that, that y'all know about is theism. Theism is the view that God created the universe and has a personal relationship with his creation. So like the God of the Bible, the God of Christians. God created the universe and he has a personal relationship with you and other humans. And he intervenes sometimes on earth and in the universe. Christianity is an example of a uh, theistic view of God. There are other ways to view God, though, or other conceptions of God. Another one is pantheism. Whereas theism casts God as an agent kind of. God is a, is a person that does stuff. Pantheism kind of doesn't really conceptualize God as an agent, like we're agents. Pantheism is the view that the universe or nature is God, or that the universe is a manifestation of God. In the theistic view, there's some sort of separation between God and the universe, right? The universe is one thing, and God is kind of his own thing. And he does stuff in the universe, but they're separate. The pantheistic view says, no, the universe is God, or nature is God. There's not that separation there. And generally, pantheists don't conceptualize God as a person, you know, like you and I are people, but kind of more, I don't know, holistically, in a way. God is, God is just kind of on this view. The universe and that which structures how the universe works. One other view I want to bring up. Pan I think it's called panentheism. Panentheism. It's similar to pantheism, but it has one important difference. Panentheism tries to maintain the separation 
of God and his existence, but it also wants to say that God is in everything. So panantheus, panantheism is the view that God is in everything, but is not equivalent to the universe. So the, the panantheist would say God is in you, and there's God in this table, and there's God on the floor. God's everywhere. But that stuff isn't the same as God. Like, God resides in it, but God, like, isn't equivalent to all that stuff. Does that make sense? Kind of a, it's an interesting view. It's the view that God is everywhere and in everything in the universe, but he is separate from the universe in a way. So the pantheist is going to say, nature is God. And the panantheist is going to say, "Eh, God's in nature, but they're different things, buddy. It tries to maintain that kind of separation between God and his creation that theism has. But it might not take the view of God that casts him as like a person that has a relationship with you like theism does. Does that make sense? This is all positive theology. There's another way to do theology. Can anybody guess its name? Negative Negative theology, yeah. (laughs) Is it based on fear? Is it based on what? Fear? Fear? No. No. Negative theology is trying to get at God only by describing what he's not. Describing God with negative claims. So what would be an example of a negative theological claim? Something like, God isn't sinful. God is not evil. God is not finite. God is not an apple. Those are all negative descriptions. Generally, theologians that are doing negative theology basically think this God person thing, we can't understand it within our categories and our concepts of things. All we can say is what he's not. We can't like accurately say what he is because he's so beyond our understanding. Is the distinction between positive and negative does it make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Most of the theological writings you'll read are in the positive theological tradition. But I wanted to uh, make you aware of this distinction because there are different ways of uh, studying God or talking about God. Aquinas is in the positive theological tradition. So he's going to be describing God and his works by attributing things to him. Not by merely saying what he's not. All right. Now let's get to some of his proofs for the existence of God. What did you all think about these? Did you like them? Did you think they were interesting? Did you think they were hogwash? Anybody? I think negative theism. Yeah, negative theology. Yeah, yeah. 
theologies, yeah. I think it's interesting because like basically like what you're saying is like God, like they they're saying that God is more than what we can understand and put in like regular words like 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 or regular ideas. It's more Yeah, than yeah. So to call God like, all powerful doesn't capture what God is. Yeah. Like God is beyond even that. You know? Yeah. Beyond human mind. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the reasons I like negative theology too, is because I don't know, I think it's it can be a little more interesting, you know? I'm not going to go over all of Aquinas' proofs for God. He lists five of them, right? The, the excerpt that I gave you was the five ways or the five proofs. We're only going to look at three of them because, honestly, trying to go through them all would take too much time. So I'm going to take what I think are the most interesting ones. One of the first uh, ones, it might actually be the first proof. Is it the first proof? Uh, first one's from change is the argument from motion. Does anybody know how this argument goes? Can they remember? Nothing's in infinite motion unless someone something she calls it the golden motion or something. Yeah, yeah. So he starts off with the basic claim, there are things in the universe that are in motion. Right? There are things that are moving. However, something can only be in motion if it's moved by something else. This marker that I'm using to write this can't make itself move, right? If this marker is going to move, something has to move it. That's my hand, right? So this marker's being in motion is caused by my hand. Or think of like billiard balls, right? They're all sitting on the table, but you can only get one of them to move Unless, like, you hit it with the pool cue, right? So there are things in motion, but in order for something to start moving, something else needs to start that process. Something else needs to, to get it in motion. We can imagine each thing moving as the thing that is uh, basically in a chain of things that have moved other things, right? So this marker is moving right now because my hand's moving. But why is my hand moving? Well, because maybe my muscle tendons are contracting and expanding. They're moving. And why are my muscles contracting and expanding? Well, because of chemical processes in the ligaments that are in motion. How are those in motion? Well, there's a brain process in motion that's going on right now that's like making that stuff move. But, he says, there can't be an infinite chain of these movers, each causing something to move, right? Because there was a beginning of the universe, right? There was a time when there was nothing, now there's something. So there needs to be something that at the very beginning, is the first mover. The first mover that wasn't moved by anything else. An unmoved mover. That's God.
God's the one that set everything in motion. The first unmoved mover. Or rather, we can rephrase this as the only thing that could be an unmoved mover is God. What do you think about this argument? Do you like it? Where's the flaw in the logic here? It's interesting, right? There are things in motion. Something's only in motion if something else causes it to move. Can't have an infinite chain of movers because there was a point at which the universe came into existence, right? So there's got to be something that kicked the whole thing off. He's like, that's God. Or maybe he's right in saying there's something that kicked it all off, but maybe it's not God. Maybe it's something else. But I don't know. What could that be? It's hard to say. Uh, for example, like the universe and the Big Bang Theory. Like, okay, so the universe started like by that explosion, but before that, like, what? what was yeah. That? Yeah. Before that, there was nothing, right? Yeah. And and what? Like whatever, like whatever that was that exploded. Like what was that? And was was there like just one thing that exploded? Or there was more. Is there more like with like, you know, with more space in between? Like. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Do you do you find this argument convincing? I mean, it kind of like doesn't make sense. Like if you think about how like the sun and explanation for how we are here is like we all started as like, you know bacteria that evolved into this that evolved into monkeys that evolved into us whatever but, but we all started as like these little micro organisms so while things aren't necessarily moving like in a worldly level things are still moving you know in that tiny microscopic level Mm -hmm. So you think like they didn't really need anything to move them? I don't know. Well, I mean, stuff's in motion now, right? Yeah. Was there a time in the universe where there was nothing in motion? I guess that would be right before the Big before Bang, the Big right? Bang, yeah, it was before the Big Bang, there was no time either. Yeah, before, exactly, there was no time, so even to talk about before the Big Bang doesn't make sense, right? But we kind of know what we're talking about when we say that. I mean, isn't that how Genesis also describes the, the before the let there be light? Yeah, yeah, if you want to get really mystical with it, yeah. The the beginning of the Bible starts off with kind of uh, an interesting creation story. So, this is an argument, it doesn't really justify you know, because the, the unmoved mover, uh, you know, I, it's not foolproof, but like I understand the idea of like, okay, there's an unmoved mover. Um, mm -hmm. That wasn't moved by something it, else. It's put yeah. in very basic, uh, almost primitive terms, but I understand that idea, but there's no real argument for that unmoved mover, mover being an entity, something with. Mm, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe maybe there's an un maybe there's an unmoved mover, but maybe calling that unmoved mover God is taking a uh, unjustifiable logical step. At least with you this know? argument, like it, it it makes you ponder, and I think that and that it serves that purpose. I have a question. Yes. Um, what what is the You know, um, a lot of people think 
saying that the answer is God is like a cop out, you know? Um, but I don't know, it's different for everybody. But did you want to uh, say something? Yeah, but then I couldn't think of a specific word, but that's like the difference between atheism and uh, yeah. agnostic. agnostic. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like atheism is just the complete denial, but being agnostic is saying, well, there might be something, but I don't know what it is, and I'm not going to pretend to know, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Agnostic. Yeah. Like a pretty, at least nowadays, I feel like it's a very pretty common train of thought in people. It's like. Well, I don't know what's out there, but I'm not going to pretend to know either, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. One thing I'm just, like, kind of trying to think about is, like, so how does just, like, gravity fit in there? Like, yeah. could you theoretically, you can have something move due to gravity. So but gravity had to come from somewhere, right? Yeah, right. gravity had to come from mass. It's That's what I mean. By it. It's in very primitive term, terms. It's just yeah. Wouldn't gravity be technically considered a mover? Yeah. Like there are a lot of other factors that just like things hitting into other things and moving them directly. Gravity is a good example, or rather, it's a good segue into the next argument he makes: the argument from causation, right? Each thing in the universe has a cause. Right? Mm -hmm. Why is this marker moving? The cause of the marker moving is my hand, right, or my body. Things don't magically pop into existence, things cause other things to happen, right? But nothing can be the cause of itself. Another way to say that is, everything that is caused was caused by something else. You know how this goes, right? There can't be an infinite chain of causality, right? Because as far as we know, the universe had a beginning. So there's a point where the chain stops. There must be something that is at the beginning, a first uncaused cause. What's the first one cause cause? It's God. It has to be God. This kind of answers your question about gravity, right? Something caused gravity to come into existence. Right? Gravity wasn't always a part of the universe because the universe wasn't always in existence, right? Yes? So is his theory based on like the creation of the universe being linear, or does he acknowledge that a cycle exists if he thinks that something has to start the cycle? Mm. Uh, I think he thinks it's linear, but even with a cyclical universe, it had to come from somewhere, right? So even, in a, even if you're thinking cyclically, there would still have to be a something that brought the universe into existence, right? 
Is this a better argument than the argument from motion? I like the way this one is phrased better. Because it's very similar in nature to the previous argument. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's in a more abstract, universal way. Like saying some, that, that uh, there can be an uncaused cause. I feel like it's a more articulate, like it's a smarter way than saying there's an, un, there's an un, un the, the argument for motion, I think, is a particular kind of causation argument, right? It's like a, a subtype. It's not as general. This one's more general, yeah. right? What do you think? Are you convinced? Is there a flaw in his logic anywhere? Well, that, that kind of makes sense, like, in that, because, like, right now we're, like, we're, like, using the kind of the big time theory. Yeah. But that's just a theory. I mean, there's more than one. And if you use that, I mean, it makes sense. You can you can say that it's bulletproof because there's more than one theory. Like, that's not, like, something mm. else could have happened. Well, yeah, so think about, um, think about another theory. What's another way that the universe came into existence? Or has the, maybe you think the universe has always been around. Does anybody think that? Space flooding. It would be, it always exists, or God made it. Or, you believe the universe always existed? Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay. The contemporary understanding is that the universe is expanding, so what's it expanding from? And then that's where we get the big bang. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, the contemporary scientific theory that I think was pioneered by um, Hawking, right, is that, yeah, there's there must have been a point at which the expansion began, began and, like, which emanated from, be right? The causation. Huh? Which would be the causation. Which would be causation, right, yeah. It didn't always still like concept of time before the Big Bang always was a thing. You I yeah, I mean you can think the universe has always existed, right? Like if you think that the universe didn't have the beginning, then maybe these arguments don't really convince you. But then again, if the universe has always existed. Does that explain why stuff moves? Unless you also say stuff has always been moving. What if this is not, what if <laughs> you know, like yeah. motion never yeah. ends. But what if this is not the only universe? Like, what if uh, there, there was just not one explosion? The, the space is just like space. Small favor. Could be like infinite like space. Like uh huh. Yeah. Just what itself. if uh, yeah. that? Big explosion was created by like another big explosion. Oh, that's what it is. I I I, I, I just want to mention like the way I didn't really think about it before of um, if there is a cycle then it somehow would have had a start I suppose but like I thought about it as Big Bang everything expands until it reaches the point of uh, was it the cold bath? Uh huh. When everything loses its momentum. Yeah, the, the big. It loses its momentum. It eventually has to take gravity to the closest thing, whatever it is, and then that recollapses. The big crunch. To cause the thing, the bang and crush, just infinitely. Yeah. And then I guess you can say, you know, that that has been happening forever, but. Just like, I don't know. I don't know. Just, yeah, it's not like we can go back. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I like this argument better than the motion argument. I think this one's a little cooler. Yeah. But maybe again, this this uncaused cause thing. I don't know. Maybe that's something else. Does it mean it has to be God? It has to be something that's outside of time. With different. Right? If the Big Bang Theory is correct. I, I, yeah. I thought. So you know how we're, we're three-dimensional beings, but we perceive everything in 2D. 
Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So if we were to draw like a square, right? And a, for a two-dimensional being to see us draw a square, it would just be a line, right? So what if a four-dimensional being were to draw their version of a square and we saw like our version of a square, you know? And so they could have so we see in like 2D, but they could see in like three dimensions. Yeah. You know? And so they could manipulate with how we see reality, you know, like this could be something completely else to them. Uh -huh. you know, just placing stuff in. Yeah. It'd be right. yeah, but, we, but we wouldn't be able to see them because they're in whole different plane of existence. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, I mean maybe thought. maybe they're the cause of the universe. Then you gotta ask <laughs> what <laughs> how did they come into existence, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> <with them, then. laughs> Yeah, this is the fourth dimensional. I want to consider one more argument, and then we're going to move on talking about Blaise Pascal. This, this argument is the hardest to wrap your head around, I think. It's really hard for me to wrap my head around. I think I understand it, and then I read it again, and I'm like, I don't know what the hell this says. It's the argument from contingency. Some things in the universe, in fact, a lot of things in the universe, are contingent. What does that mean? That means they can either exist or not exist. Their existence is not necessary. So like this marker, for example, we generally think like a marker like this, it's a contingent thing. What does that mean? Well, it exists right now and it can keep existing or we could pulverize it and destroy it and there'd be no more marker, right? We have the ability to do that or a table or humans, you know, you weren't existing and then you came into existence and then someday you'll die, right? So you're capable of both existing and non-existing. However, not everything in the universe can be contingent. contingent, there must have been a point where all contingent things were non-existent. Think about it like this. If everything in the universe is capable of existing or not existing, then what that means is if that thing ceases to exist, it can't be brought back into existence. Right? Like if we dissolve this marker, we can't undo that. We can go create a new marker, right? I can go get a marker from another room, but this marker is gone. So if we just kind of let time do its thing, if everything could either exist or not exist, there must reach a point where all contingent things 
are non-existent. So there's nothing that exists in the universe. But if there was a point where everything was non-existent, how could the universe get started back up again? How could there be anything? How could there be any stuff? But it's obvious that there are things that exist right now. Right? Things exist. Not everything is non-existent. So that must mean that not everything that exists is contingent. Another way of saying this is there might be things, or at least one thing, that is necessary which exists. That is, it can't not exist. There must be something that's necessary. But a thing's being necessary, it gets from something else. In other words, necessary things get their necessity from an outside source. chain of necessity going back forever so there must be something that exists that is necessary in itself and doesn't get its necessity from anything else. What's that going to be? God. It's going to be God. things get their necessity. The biggest problem I have with this argument is this premise right here. I don't understand this. Why does that have to be true? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, I, 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 I I just don't even understand how that's like a point. Like I feel like nothing after it should be. Because it doesn't make sense to me how that is even true. Mm -hmm. True enough to be a fact that you can base other things off of. Yeah, 
Maybe let's think about the beginning of the universe again. Contemporary scientific theories basically think that, you know, this existence thing is all an accident, right? Like, we just happen to come into existence, right? Evolution just happened to work. The, the Big Bang just happened to be a thing that happened, right? But there must have been something that got the Big Bang started. So we're back to the causation thing. And that's God. Why, what I don't understand about this is, why can't we just say, this hasn't happened yet? You know, why, why does, what I don't understand is, why does he say, there must have been a point where everything was non-existent, if everything is contingent, you know? Why can't we just say, eh, this is true, but it just, it just happened, hasn't happened yet, you know? Everything that exists is, is contingent, but somehow, somehow the universe has done a good job in not destroying everything, you know? This is the one that, that confuses me a little bit. I don't think I completely understand it. Because the other arguments seem like there aren't any gaps in his logic, right? It would be strange that he would include this argument that seems not to make much sense, right? So I am I think that maybe there's something I'm not getting. I, I mean, I think that's just a point where all contingent things were non-existent, as in, like, in the past, mm -hmm. which is there was nothing and then God made something. So did he do it? Yeah. It's not... Like, maybe yeah, you know, maybe this argument is dependent on the causation argument. Yeah, maybe that's it. That's how I yeah. have to view it out. Yeah, maybe you can't maybe you can't take this argument by itself. Maybe you have to take this argument only in light of the other arguments that he's given. You know? So he's like, look, you buy the causation argument, if you buy that, look, here's another one. You know, maybe that's it. Is anybody else having a hard time understanding this one? I am. I'm not going to make you write this argument on the exam or anything, so don't worry about that. I might ask you to, to give one of the arguments, but I'm not going to ask you to do this one specifically because this one's hard. This is the one, yeah, that everybody's going to remember because nobody gets it. Like, I get that, I get, I get these, I get these premises, right? I understand this. If there was a point where everything was non-existent, how did it all get started up again, right? If there was stuff that existed and then everything stopped existing, how is there stuff existing after that, you know, without some divine intervention, you know? I get that, but I it's this premise that, that I'm stuck on. It's like coming to the end of yourself. Like I, I, I don't understand it. I'm saying that that's my perception of it. It's just like okay, it's just it's just coming to a place where you just die. Okay, you just die. Nothing else exists past that. Like it's like you ever like to fall asleep. Like not when you went to too bad and just like you was woke one second and then you weren't. Yeah. And, and then you just you're saying, uh, I think we should just like really take him at his word though when he says like everything is there's nothing in the universe. You know? If if that is true, then how could there be anything in the universe? Well he's just a man himself. Like he came from yeah. a mother and a father. He came from, you know, he, he was created out of nothing to something too, right? So I'm just thinking like the whole just to like to be stuck at the place where you think well how can if something goes to a place of non-existence? I believe that that happens. I believe that it is. But what, what's your what's your consciousness? What's your conscious of the surrounding or being awake? You're being woke, but that doesn't mean you're not existing. You're not conscious of it. Mm. Okay, I see. Yeah, I see what you're saying.
time. Consciousness comes later, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it's interesting. Already, already existed. Is it, yeah, does anybody have anything else to say about this? Else, I'm going to go on to Pascal. Yeah. I mean, it, it, makes, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it with the other things. Like, if you think about like, the life being physical, it doesn't make any sense. But if you think about it in like, the perspective of what she was saying, like, consciousness and spirituality, like, yeah. Mm, yeah. 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 I, if that helps you, you know, get this good. I'm gonna have to reread it because I I think this is this argument's kind of tough. But again, I'm uh, I'm not gonna ask you to rewrite this on the exam. So don't uh, unless you want to. You know, this is the one you choose. Like, good luck. <laughs> If you're gonna if you're gonna write on this one, you got you're gonna have to explain it to me. Otherwise, you know your essay. I'm just gonna be like I don't understand your essay. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe just don't touch it. But okay, let's um. We looked over some proofs of the existence of God, or at least what Aquinas says are proofs for the existence of God. Some of them seem to make sense to you. You know, then you seem to buy. Uh, maybe you don't buy. You know. The conclusion that it un the unmoved mover is God or the uncaused cause is God, but Aquinas thinks that's the only answer. He thinks that if there is an unmoved mover or an uncaused cause, what else could it be other than God, right? Because God's outside of time. God is eternal, you know, all these things. But let's talk about now your relationship with God. Ooh. Pascal has some stuff to say about this. So the second piece on God that I asked you to read is by this French guy, Blaise Pascal. He lived hundreds of years after Thomas Aquinas, but he was still really interested in this question of God. And if you do the reading that I assigned you, it's obvious that he's really agonizing about this question. You know, he's like, what can I say about God? You know, my reason can't prove to me that God exists, but yet, how can I believe that God doesn't exist at the same time, you know, and, and how should I live my life in light of this question? Pascal is writing something of a, of a confessional, I think, in this piece. And I think it's an, it's an interesting reading to, to give a look over because it's something that I think impacts all of us in a certain way. His insights into this really describe the human experience well. But Pascal was an influential French philosopher, mathematician, If any of you take any physics classes and you're talking about, you know, fluids and pressure, you may have heard of a unit called Pascal's, named after this guy. He wrote on so much stuff, theology, philosophy, math, physics, He was an inventor. He was actually a child prodigy, too. He was incredibly intelligent.
I think he wrote his first book when he was math book, mathematics book that got a lot of attention and praise when he was 16. That's how well he understood this stuff. You know, at least the science of his time. So he was a really smart dude. And he came up with this idea of the wager, which we're going to talk about here. So in this piece, like I said, he was writing kind of a confessional. He's thinking to himself about this question of God's existence. And he's really trying to, to rack his brain around or whether he can determine if God exists or not. And he's really anxious about this, and he's agonizing over it. He says, looking at the universe doesn't tell us that God exists. It seems that the universe offers us evidence that he exists, and it seems to offer us evidence that he doesn't exist. The universe doesn't show us one way or another. He says, it's obvious if we look hard enough that there's evidence for and against God. And this really bugs him. Because obviously he wants to know, right? Because if God exists, he wants to believe in God and live a life that is... Uh, praiseworthy to God, but if God doesn't exist, he doesn't want to spend all of his time thinking about this, right? He wants to do other stuff, and he kind of wants to, you know, be his own person. This problem of not knowing whether or not God exists because there's not a clear sign of it, this is called the problem of divine hiddenness. God doesn't just come down from heaven into your life and say, I exist, believe in me. Right? God doesn't do that. At least not to us anymore. Maybe he used to do that with the Israelites and stuff. But no matter how hard we search and search, it seems like God is hidden to us in a way that doesn't show us one way or another whether we should believe in him. If you've ever seen the movie uh, The Seventh Seal, it is a famous... Uh, it, it talks about divine hiddenness a lot. It's one of the problems that the main character struggles with through the entire movie. So much so that he ends up uh, challenging Death, the Grim Reaper, to a chess game to kind of stave off his death. Because he's like, I don't know if God exists or not. Like, I gotta give me some more time. Pascal, in this piece, writes about how it's not just God that's like this for us. We're confronted with many mysteries in life that we don't hold the answers to. Yet, we want assurances for these things at the end of the day. Right? We want to know what's true and what's not. What's good and what's bad? What's correct and what's false? He really longs to have faith, to have this assurance in God.
when he starts to think about God, he starts to realize, well, shoot, all the things that God is, I can't even wrap my head around that. This kind of goes back to the negative theology point that we brought up earlier. He says, God's infinite, but how do I understand that? What does it mean for something to be infinite? I can't really wrap my head around that. The very concept of God seems incomprehensible to us. something that's infinite? But yet, in a weird way, we can still understand it and use it as a concept. In a certain sense, we can still know what infinity is. We can know what a unicorn is, but unicorns don't really exist, right? We don't have any, uh, any real-world evidence to understand a unicorn, but yet we can kind of know it in a sense. We can know what something that is infinitely large is, in a sense, but we can't imagine it, right? We can know that, for example, if this is true, we can know that there's an edge to the universe, in a sense, but we can't imagine an edge to the universe, right? Or, to actually take the real life example, we can know that space is infinite, in a sense, but we can't imagine that space is infinite, right? So there's a weird sense in which we can kind of know things that are incomprehensible to us that we can't wrap our minds around. Like we have some sort of way that we can know it, but we still can't completely grasp it. One of the things that Pascal says, the reason for this, is that the way we think about the world, our reasoning capacities, they only get us so far. They're limited, right? And then furthermore, he ends up saying, trying to use logical argumentation in our reasoning capacities to prove God, that isn't going to work for us. Try as we might, looking at all the arguments for the existence of God, looking at all the evidence, still doesn't give us the assurance that we want, right? We're still kind of left wanting more, right? We want to know for sure. And reason can't get us there. Reason can't allow us to know for sure. Funnily enough, I don't think he intended this, but he ends up developing a good argument for believing that God exists. This is known as Pascal's wager. We are all placing a bet on the existence of God, whether we know it or not, with how we live our lives.
There is no neutral stance one can take towards the existence of God. You can either believe that God exists or not believe that God exists. But whatever stance you take, whether you try to believe in him, whether you try to ignore him, you're still placing a bet on his existence by the way you're living, right? If God does exist and you decide to, you know, try to believe that he exists, you're placing your bet on, yeah, God exists. But the stance that you take towards God's existence is not neutral. All right, you're not like uh, Switzerland in World Wars or something, right? Or whatever it is the neutral country is that doesn't get involved in this stuff. With how you're living your life and what you're thinking and what you're believing, you're taking a stance on this whether you realize it or not. Choosing not to take a side Choosing not to believe in God or choosing not to disbelieve in God, he's still ultimately taking a sign. Why is not taking a side still taking a sign? Because what's going to happen to you after you die depends on whether you believe in him or not. Right? If you believe in him, you chose a good side, if God exists. If you don't believe in him and he does exist, and you're just like, eh, I'm not really going to think about it, you've chosen a bad side. Right? The fate of your soul hangs in the balance. You can either choose to believe in God or not believe in God. What happens if we What happens if we believe in God and he exists? Heaven. Yeah, infinite pleasure and happiness. And he says, we live a moral life. What do we lose by doing this? Maybe some fun, right? Can't have an orgy with all your friends. What happens if we believe God exists, but he doesn't actually exist? What do we gain? You live the moral life. You live a moral, yeah, you live a good life, right? What do you lose? Well, again, you lose some fun, and maybe people are like, that guy was stupid. Right? You lose fun and look a little stupid. What happens? If you don't believe in God, and God exists. Yeah, infinite pain and suffering. And what did you gain from living a life like that? Some fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got some fun. Also, you might write down as a negative, you kind of lived like an asshole, maybe. But not necessarily. Not necessarily. What happens if you don't believe in God, and God doesn't exist? What do you gain? Had some fun. You had some fun, yeah. You, you, you know, you popped your molly, you had your orgies. What 
What's the rational thing to do here? You will always act as if you believe. Yeah. Why? Because you have everything to gain, infinity to gain, and finite to lose. Acting like you don't believe, you have finite to gain, but infinite to lose. Eternal suffering. So, if you're a rational person, you should bet on God's existence, and you should live like that. What do you think? Is anybody going to go to the church after this and start praying? No? This doesn't, doesn't convince you? We want more cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question for you. How do we know that the God of the Bible is the God that exists? Maybe you're thinking, you know, this doesn't really affect me because... I don't really think that that's the God that exists. Maybe you're like a pantheist and you think God is nature or something. You don't have to worry about heaven or hell, you know? Do you like this argument for belief in God? You think it's kind of cool, interesting? That's really interesting. Yeah? And he came up with it because he was really agonizing about this, right? He's like... You know, either God's out there or God's not. It seems I have everything to gain if I live the way God wants me to and I believe in him, right? I feel like he could totally convince you if you, if you talk to him in real life. If you talk to him in real life, <laughs> yeah, you, you might be a smooth talker. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he, he'd be like, this doesn't keep you up at night, like, thinking about this? Dude, you haven't thought about it long enough, you know, like... How are how are y'all gonna bet going forward? Uh, oh, well, we don't have to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like hypothetically, if you chose to live your life non-believing and there was no God, I think it might be like a little bit more than some fun. Because if there is no God, you know that's your entire existence. Entire life. Yeah, and like if you like read the Bible closely, it's like you can't like wear two different fabrics at the same time. All these like interesting, you know, for lack of a better word, speculations. So it's like, is all your game by not believing just some fun, or is it? I mean, yeah. it's a finite amount of fun, though. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's the sticking point. Yeah. It's a fun. You can't have inf infinite fun on Earth, right? right? You can have you can have a good deal of fun. Yeah. But but another thing is that is. You can still break some of the rules, right, and get into heaven. Right? Yeah, I mean, hypothetically, you can repent. Christianity says, you know, if you murder someone and you're actually repentant, you know, that's not going to be on your record. Well, that's not really repentant. To intend to do bad things but then repent later is antithetical to the idea of repentance. Correct. And then also. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, if you. If you Real repentance is not yeah. premeditated, yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I'll, just, I'll just say it. Oh, sorry, afterwards. <laughs> if the yeah. faith were also, like, leaning on... Let's say there's, for to make it less complicated, there's one faith in the balance here, whether you believe in mm -hmm. that faith or not. Like, uh, it, it would depend upon that faith if it actually has to be, you know, how stingent the faith has to be. Like, if you're yeah. just saying, like, oh, I figured out the map, I have the chart here... Like I'll believe in God. Like that wouldn't be, you know, that wouldn't be coming in to, you know. That wouldn't tell you how to live. You wouldn't believe right? in God because you love God. Yeah. You would believe in God because you have the potential of infinite and happiness. <laughs> well, you you know what his answer to that is, right? He he considers the objection. I, Pascal, I can't just choose to believe in God. What are you, a crazy person? He says, if you go to church and you do the sacraments, you'll form a belief in God naturally, you know, doing the Christian stuff. You know, and then you will authentically believe after yeah. some time, you know. But another question you might want to consider is, it's obvious he's been thinking about the Judeo-Christian God when he wrote this. 
But this argument by itself doesn't tell us which God to believe in. Maybe we should believe in Shiva so they don't destroy everything. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should believe in the Zeus. ancient Greek gods, you know, Zeus. Thor and Hermann. Or the Norse gods, Don't yeah. Whichever one has the worst out of the Norse. I mean, the best out of the Norse gods. Yeah. Or the worst temper. Is <laughs> <what I'm saying. laughs> anyway, I don't know. Maybe think about God a little bit tonight. Or if you're terrified of that, no. <laughs> still, do we have free will? still, you're taking a bet. The wager is being made regardless of whether you choose to take a side or not, right? With how you live your life, you're placing a bet. All right, that's all I got for you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a good weekend. Thank you, you too. Thank you. I won't be sleeping tonight. <laughs> Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. You have a good one too.